right, welcome to the Conversation Shop with Cedric Page. I want to welcome you to the show today. I have two very special guests. I have Mr. Haywood Simmons and I have Mr. Steve Whalen. We have Haywood Simmons from the Haywood Simmons organization. We're going to start the show uh, discussing navigating assumptions and specifically navigating assumptions that we make uh, as people specifically between African Americans or people of color and between Caucasian Americans. Uh, we have to navigate those assumptions and have conversations about how to get past those assumptions so we can have real conversation. What we're also going to be talking about on the show is solutions. How can we as individuals help ourselves uh, move forward in a positive way um, to stop making these assumptions and make um, and to make connections uh, with people that are genuine and that are intentional. So we call those intentional uh, friendships, intentional connections. So again, uh, Haywood and Steve, I want to thank you for joining me on the show today. And uh, again, I thought it was a very interesting topic. The, the, the topic came from a conversation uh, myself and these gentlemen had outside of my house on the weekend where we were talking about some of the assumptions that uh, we make as African American uh, men or people of color and that uh, the mainstream America or Caucasian men or women or uh, people who look like Steve make about people of color. And one of the things that uh, real quickly that we talked about to put it in perspective was, for instance, um, assuming that every person that looks like Steve or Caucasian person has the power to deny me a job, deny me food, de deny me life, liberty, and the pursuit of, of happiness. There's an assumption that's made that because of his or because of white skin that, it, that that immediately puts you in opposition to me and puts me in opposition to you. So that's an example of some of the assumptions that are being made. I'm going to let Mr. Haywood Simmons um, and Mr. Steve Whalen elaborate on, on, on their perspective on what some of those assumptions are and how we can get past those. Haywood, why don't you share your opinion with me on that topic? Yeah, said thank you. First, I want to say thank you and uh, how much I appreciate the show and the platform that you create for us to be able to come on and have discussions that are really near and dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm really grateful that we'll get a chance to make some leeway here tonight. Um, assumptions. It's really easy, I think, by nature for mm -hmm. us to assume like that we know something. It's a natural habit is one way that I protect myself, right? I need to know who this guy is. How close can I have him sit to me? How safe am I? How safe is he as according to me? And we judge ourselves as according to our proximity to others. It seems to be a natural part of how our brain works. And trust. Keep, yeah. And then we need to be able to trust like how close and you can tell from body language mm -hmm. when someone's uncomfortable or not comfortable arms open mm -hmm. how they breathe how they look at one another you can usually tell so we always are, are prone to make these assumptions and mm -hmm. these assumptions uh, that I learned in my studies and practice in life are based off of our experiences right. largely off of our experiences and being an African-American male uh, before I was introduced to the idea of double consciousness here at the University of Wisconsin, but right. the first, that started to free me a little bit. Mm -hmm. Wow, I do do that. I, ha I do have different lenses by which I view myself. Mm -hmm. But to understand that we come to the table <clears throat> with our own experiences, and if we're not careful, we'll project those experiences on the entire world. Now share with, with, with me and the audience um, elaborate on what some of those individual assumptions are and how you uh, specifically, you know, maybe made some mistakes navigating them in the past and how with your enlightenment, how would you navigate those in the future and navigate them now, I should say. One is understanding who I am. Having mm -hmm. been a, a professional football player, a college football player, a high school football player, <laughs> I. Uh, I thought I was the short six inch and a third guy that 
had very little talent. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that my arms were longer than some guys that were 6'5 and 6'4, but that I was the person that had sold myself short. Mm -hmm. I used to have a saying that the biggest liar I ever met <coughs> is me. It's yourself. It's me. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the assumptions that I made about life is one that maybe that white men had it easier than me. Right. I remember there's I think a friend in the South, yeah. we all make that assumption. Oh, they yeah. got it easy. They got to be living better than us because we tow up. And right? that the, yeah, and that, the, and that the South <laughs> makes a difference. I had a friend <laughs> from Wisconsin, Jim Cedarwall. I forget exactly where Jim's from, up north, some right around in, in the area. And I was talking about being in Spain. Mm -hmm. And I had no, and this was not shameful, but it was relatively recent. This right. was within the last five years that I was really shocked to learn that Jim was spanked like I was. Like, no way a white guy in Wisconsin got spanked. Mm -hmm. like, you, your people don't do that. That doesn't happen. That's a Southern <laughs> thing right. that comes straight out of slavery. And it that's never, a Southern black right, folks. Right, and it never crossed over the line, and that's a horrible form of PTSD that's only bestowed upon black people from the South. Right. And I found out that wasn't 100% the case. Yes. That this was a white male from Wisconsin, and he had been spanked. Mm -hmm. and, and we still could have more conversations about that. How did that happen? What did they say? Did they talk to you and spell everything out? Like, what type of spanking <laughs> did you get that I didn't get? But so um, believing that, like, blacks were spanked and that we were whipped and that whites were never spanked and whipped, that was a thing, I believe. Right. Believing that by nature, uh, I was not as smart. Just, just that they got it. They understood white culture. They understood the test better than me. They understood math just by nature better than me. Everything easy for them. Everything, everything was easy. easy. I, I was a second class citizen. I had to prove myself. Everybody thought that about me. There were a lot of things that I believed until I realized that those were mostly thoughts I held about myself. Because in every book I read, there were the Marcus Garvey's. There were the there were there were other people. There was uh, uh, Martin Luther King. There were others that were inspiring people. There was folks long before that mm -hmm. that inspired people and that uh, led us into a place that we could see that we were more than that. And mm -hmm. so when I was able to be exposed to that and learn that, it really uh, changed the way. So the enoughness to know now that I am enough and to approach every day from feeling good and feeling like I'm enough changes the way I'm able to see the world. Yeah, you, you, you talk about, I call it the self-fulfilling prophecy, mm -hmm. how we set limitations on ourselves. And to me, that's one of the main sicknesses, uh, a remnant of, of white supremacy, institutionalized racism, is that um, as people of color, you know, we raise our children with limitation. I know that uh, I suggested this with Steve. I said, Steve, when you raise your children, you raise your kids to, to look at the world and the world is your oyster. You can go out into the world and you can accomplish and you can do anything that you want to. Now, I tell my children the exact same thing, but with a caveat. Mm. But you may run into this, you may run into that. Now, the reason I use that as an example now, are the things that they're gonna run into, is that something that's real? Yeah, that's something that's definitely real, but I can't, I can't weigh them down or put an anchor on them because of it. Because I tell my children they have to succeed and strive despite those things. So yes, is, are these things real? Uh, is life fair? In certain situations they go through, is that going to be fair to them? And I go, at times, no. But does that mean you don't fight hard? And that, does that mean you don't believe in yourself? And does that mean you don't push forward? We push forward despite that. So I tell people the best way to understand me is that I push forward despite any thing that's placed in front of me. Any hole, any canyon, any cannon, any gun, I'm moving forward until God stops me in my tracks and puts me in the dirt. So those are some of the things and that I teach my kids to rise above those kinds of limitations so we can look past some of the assumptions. Because the assumptions that I made in the past came from lack of trust. Now they were based on reality. Someone says, I don't like black folks, I'm gonna hang you, I'm gonna kill you, I'm gonna do things. A lot of the fear, the mistrust came from a place of survival mm -hmm. growing up in the South. So I have to make decisions. I can't trust you because you may take me someplace and wanna do something to me. Mm -hmm. 
you may just be manipulating me, telling me that you're my friend. Mm. So again, those are some of the things I want to navigate. So uh, before we finish this segment, Steve, I want to let you take us into the end of this segment by sharing with me your perspective on this topic as well. Sure. So we're talking about assumptions and the assumptions that I came to, you know, growing up in a predominantly white community. Um, I had parents that raised me, you know, to treat all people fairly and not um, based on the content of their character and not the color of their skin. So I had that going for me, but I will say that until I was in college um, and was, you know, living in a dorm with a person of color living right next door to me in the dorm, I didn't have a lot of exposure to people of color. So mm -hmm. my assumption really was I've got my team and they've got their team and we are going to we can live together, we can coexist together, but we're not really going to intermingle with each other and we're not going to have um, meaningful friendships um, with each other. Mm -hmm. Just because they've got their, their thing going on, I've got my thing going on, I'm navigating my life, you know, um, at the same time trying to figure out how I survive, how I get ahead, how I, you know, get a good job, how I, you know, find a place to raise my family as I as I navigate through college and, and then into uh, my adult life. But elaborate, so, elaborate on that a little bit for me, Steve, sure. when you said, you know, when you saw maybe that minority person that was in the same dorm as you and that they're in your life, they're gonna do their thing, I'm gonna do mine. Talk to me a little bit about that assumption that that was made about the, the separate, separativeness, yeah. because so, why wouldn't the assumption be made that someone I'm gonna get to know and I could possibly be a friend? Because I had the assumption that that person didn't want me to be their friend, didn't want me to be on their Thank team, you for sharing that. didn't want me to be with them. They had their thing going on. I had the perception that there was resentment on the um, part of that person for the color of my skin and for what I represented to him um, or her as the other side or the, the side that was being treated unfairly for the better um, where they were not being treated the same way I was. Now, um, did they, was that anything that was done to you to make you feel that way or was that just something you just kind of was just navigating trying to figure out on your own? Yeah, again it was it was more like I didn't see a lot of them taking the initiative to initiate conversation with me mm -hmm. to bring me into their their group of friends. I wasn't as well doing that. That so was we going to be my next question. So we what were both you? we were both just keeping to ourselves and this is with a lot of the people that, that I got to know or got to be exposed to mm -hmm. both in college and then uh, working my first 12 years of my life of my um, my life post-college um, in the working world in the Washington DC area mm -hmm. and then coming here to Madison um, about 20 years ago and the same thing. Um, I had a really good friend in college and I had a really good friend that I worked with at uh, my first job that was an Afri African American mm -hmm. and he actually helped me a lot to realize that we are not so different and that we share a lot of the same um, hold that thought. issues in life. So that was good. Hold that thought, hold yeah. that thought. And we're gonna let you pick right up. You're gonna start, take us into uh, segment two, but I think that's a great segue into our next segment. Hold that. Uh, guys, we'll be right back on The Conversation Shop. Hi, right, welcome back to The Conversation Shop with Cedric Page. Again, I'm here with my very special guest, Mr. Haywood Simmons and Mr. Steve Whalen. Now, in the first segment, Steve was sharing with us some of the things he navigated in terms of the show being about navigating assumptions and the remedies to navigating or overcoming making assumptions about people, specifically in interactions between people of color the mainstream Caucasian gentleman, people that look like Steve. Now, what Steve was sharing with me, in college there were some assumptions that were made on both sides that may have led to non-interaction with, 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 with people that didn't look like him. But again, after college and getting out to work, he uh, ended the segment by sharing with us a story about a gentleman 
who uh, helped him realize that we're all on the same platform. And I'm going to let Mr. Whalen uh, share that, finish sharing that story with us. So Steve, why don't you pick up where you left off and finish sharing with my audience about navigating assumptions. Sure. Thanks, Ted. So yeah, getting to know somebody and getting to understand who they were as a person, I think is really key to overcoming those assumptions that you might have um, about people that look different than you or grew up in a different culture than you. Mm -hmm. So I will say that um, before that, all I had to go on was media, mm -hmm. you know, the television shows, the movies, um, maybe what my friends or my acquaintances might tell me about folks um, of color mm -hmm. and what they're like and you know what their intention might be. So if I was confronted with a, a tall black man you know walking down the street that I'd never met before that looked pretty tough, I might be inclined to, to walk to the other side of the street and avoid you know passing that person because thank you for that uh, thank you yeah. for being honest with that yeah because I, I, I didn't know mm -hmm. I didn't know that person I didn't and I had been told by a lot of different sources that I needed to be afraid okay and let's let's examine that a little bit yeah with you Steve and again I want to thank you for your honesty you, bet. you know in terms of uh, those assumptions and and things that you heard the things that you watched on television those those images yep. so would you say that a lot of the images or representations of people of color that would help shape your opinion weren't necessarily positive images that you were seeing. Would you, would you suggest that? Because I would suggest that if they were positive images, then it would, it would say he could possibly be your friend versus you need to cross the street because he may harm you. Yes. So again, I just want you to elaborate, if you don't mind, a little bit on what some of those images you may have been exposed to were, and if you don't, also don't mind, just, just share with me how they affected you, because knowing you and, and hearing in your voice, you, you have an affinity to connect with people and want to understand people, yes. you know, and, and, and you have a wonderful heart. So, you know, it, it intrigues me how someone, someone that's in your space, how those images affected you and, 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 and led you to maybe not make connections with someone, of, a person of color in the way that you are now. Yeah. Does it make sense what I'm asking? Absolutely. Yeah. So I, again, growing up in high school, one African-American um, young man was at, went to my high school. Mm -hmm. The rest were um, either Asian gotcha. or predominantly Caucasian. Mm -hmm. uh, so watching TV, watching movies, my bias, my, what I, what I b believe I saw was um, African Americans lived in the city. Um, a lot of the African, male, African American males that lived in the city were um, maybe in a gang, mm -hmm. um, maybe involved in drugs in some way, shape or form, and um, were of a violent nature. Um, that's I what I saw. Now, hold that thought, hold yeah. that thought real quickly. Yep. Haywood, mm -hmm. tell me some of the um, things that you saw visually that may have shaped your assumptions, positive or negatively, as a person of color towards someone that looked like Steve. And I'm gonna let you pick up on your comment just real quickly. I wanna give a little balance in the right. conversation. Mm -hmm. Okay. On someone that looked like Steve. Mm -hmm. my a, a white could, person, a could, Caucasian could, man, a white man. Uh, or any I, person that wasn't black. For instance, my, my life, I, I, if I told you my story, I was the clueless kid because okay. I was a farm kid mm -hmm. and I grew up with family and people who, I mean, we had our own challenges. And so being concerned about what people, what the race was, I mean, I had mom, dad, aunts and uncles who judged me based on how I combed my hair, how I didn't, how I stood, how I sat, how I spoke. So I was not as concerned. When I did interact with, with white people, I noticed them to seem to be not, I didn't think them to be friendly. We, but in the South, it, it didn't matter that much. Right. Like, we weren't friends. They we weren't, we weren't, we weren't, go, I had a community. They weren't, they didn't have to be my friend. We, we were mannerable at school with one another. 
And if it ever got heated, the N word could fly, or some really like really mean feeling elbows that I wouldn't hit anybody with might fly. And uh, yeah, yeah, we get. Paid. I'm glad you brought that up because I want to elaborate on that a little bit because now we're we're all three of us are really being honest about the experiences too. Because one thing I want to add is each one of us had our communities. See, Haywood and I growing up in the South, so we had strong African American communities that protected us and from speaking from my perspe perspective that protection was to protect us from the white culture in the south that sought to harm us sure. and sought to do us harm and sought to take away our manhood so our communities uh, surrounded us to build our self-confidence to push us forward you know for college and all those things that the community uh, people in the community that didn't look like us, you know, was telling us not to do. Yeah. Now, what I'll say to you is this, which is putting a smile on my face. Did I ever hear anybody say that to me? No. Mm. You know, did I ever deal with some racist stuff? Of course I did. Mm. But did I ever hear, you know, anyone come to me and say, I'm not going to, I'm going to make sure you don't get this. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to make sure you do that. I'm going to make sure. I never heard those things, no. you know. I saw them visually on representations of them visually on television, Roots, everything else. Yeah. I saw Roots. I didn't trust any white man. Yeah. Right. I'm just telling you the truth. Right. I didn't. The idea I was going to beat you or punish you before they get you, I got that from somewhere. I, won't, I, you know, I don't know who, mm -hmm. but I did get that. I'm going to get you before they get you. Right. I'm going to spank you. I'm going to show you the right way before them folks get you. Okay? Right. One of my grandmamas would say before they have you on that chain gang. They're going to teach you, so I'm you won't be Yeah, I'm going to teach you before they have you on that chain wow. game. And that was a that was a real big thing, and I knew what the chain game was. Oh, <laughs> yeah. oh, oh, them boys had chains on and stripes on their suit Space. or orange. So, yeah, and I so I knew what the chain game was, so I was scared straight. Right. Well, Steve, I just wanted to give, between Haywood and I, give balance to, to what yeah. you said. But I want to give you an opportunity to pick back up on your story and finish with yeah. us. So... Having the opportunity to have a, a close friend that I worked with, we went to the same college. We just happened to take the same work with the same company as our first job, mm -hmm. as engineers in uh, the Washington D.C. area. He and I became really good friends, um, Carl Mayfield, and somebody that I grew to trust, and grew to. For he, for me, he represented the African American community, right. and he and he was a good person. He was someone. I could be comfortable with and that went a long way so my lesson there was and maybe I'm jumping ahead here on your on your talk but yeah, my lesson there was um, navigating those assumptions um, you're fed a lot of messages through life um, through people that maybe don't have a, a clear picture of what the other folks are like mm -hmm. but until you have take the time to intentionally get to know somebody that looks different than you, um, you don't really know what they're like. And, and an don't. intentional connection. I'm glad yes. you said that. And one of the other things um, that I wanted to touch on with what you, uh, what you talked about very briefly was this. I always talk about, you know, everyone, I talk to other African American people, people of color, say, oh, I don't want to be the representative for everyone else. Well, sometimes you are. Yeah. And there's a responsibility to that. And one thing I'll say is, what would have happened, Steve, if that person of color that you connected with was all bad? Yeah. You know, I may not be sitting across this table from you and, and, and having that connection. Is that good? Is that bad? Mm. You know, should we be judged by the actions of one? You know, but sometimes the action of one represents, the, represents all. Yeah. Is it fair? Often, no, but it's a way for us to protect ourselves and it comes back to trust. So what I tell other people of color and what I took upon myself, and one thing I'll say, in my walk, especially since I've been in the Midwest, I've been the only person of color in many buildings, in many offices, in many companies, the only one mm -hmm. in my space, or the first one. And one thing I realize is the responsibility that comes with it. Is it fair that I have to be the representative of everybody else? No, it's not fair, but life isn't fair. That's what I was taught. So what I have to do is 
show them through my walk, yes. through my talk, through who I am as a man, through who I am as a person, who we are, who we are as people of color, who we are as black men and black women through my walk, and who we are as brothers to you, mm -hmm. that we all are brothers. And I celebrate that in my walk. But we'll finish this uh, on the next segment. Guys, uh, we'll be right back on The Conversation Shop. Hi, welcome back to The Conversation Shop with Cedric Page. I'm here with my two very special guests, Mr. Steve Whalen and Mr. Haywood Simmons. On the last segment, um, I was discussing being the representative. Is it fair that you're a representative of your race or the representative to someone that may be making assumptions or may not have even had contact with a person that looks like you or a person of color before? So that you have a responsibility, as far as I'm concerned, to represent yourself accordingly because you may be the only experience that person has with the other side and good or bad it may affect them for the rest of their lives and that's that's black white and that's white black it goes both ways uh Haywood I want you to uh if you don't mind elaborate on that experience or if you've had any experiences like that uh, mm -hmm. for yourself but what I also would like you to segue into you know, once you share that with me, mm -hmm. is talk to me about the ways that we can rise above these assumptions, the tools that we can have as individuals to navigate these interactions in a positive way so we can sit down and have conversations like this so we can build friendships and, and, and build bridges with each other. So, go ahead. You know, I, I remember and can recall quite a few experiences in my life being afraid of people mm -hmm. and not participating in events and things because of who I thought was going to be there mm -hmm. and like the color of their skin. I remember there's a restaurant train. I mean, they chose the name Cracker Barrel. Mm -hmm. And in my hometown, Cracker Barrel sits down a hill. And all I, I can see, right, is the chairs <laughs> on the front with. porch. And so I would do everything I could not to get caught down the hill at the Cracker Barrel. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't know what the Cracker Barrel was, but they had these and big old chairs, the and they were going to get me. <laughs> and I couldn't believe that the Cracker Barrel was sitting out in public like that. Now that the barrel people. where the crackers hung out at was just right there. <laughs> Hold the thought. For those who don't know, we are not being derogatory. I'm glad he's sharing the story, but in the South, for those who don't know, the C and, word, yeah, the 19, C word, 19, is a derogatory 70. term for our people who are Caucasian. So we're not going to celebrate, but it's the name of the restaurant is Cracker Barrel. He was afraid of Cracker Barrel, so I just wanted to put it in perspective for everyone. Sure. Okay, sorry. Hey, so in the great Cracker story, Barrel, by the way. In the Cracker Barrel, I didn't go to the Cracker Barrel. That was a place, and I've eaten there since. Even though you know I do this healthy food <laughs> thing, uh, I've been there since. But there were That's years. Great food at Cracker Barrel. It was not <laughs> until healthy. I was in my 30s. I was about 32 years old before I realized or even thought about like that came off the don't eat list. <laughs> I was married with kids before Too I went funny. to Cracker Barrel the first time. It was just an off the list kind of thing. Now on the other hand, and before that thought yeah. real quick, can I be honest? I just had since you were dead on. I have to be honest too. One of my honesties is I thought Burger King were for black people. I would never go to McDonald's because I thought McDonald's was was for white. Hmm. This is growing up in the South wow. being assumptions. Yes, like. I eventually started going, but I used to never, when I say never go to McDonald's, never, ever go. I thought Burger King was black, yeah. literally. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I think that this funny to me. Oh, but yeah. go ahead, Haywood. KFC hey, was eating a high on the hog. Churchies was where I was supposed to eat. It, thank you. It, assumptions, <laughs> now it sounds really <laughs> silly, but these are yeah. the assumptions that we grow up wow. making, not going to certain places, not doing certain things. Yes. The baseball park that I was the lead, the head umpire at, assistant head umpire at, mm -hmm. I, I'm still so proud and shocked. I mean, the lead umpire, me, little me. That was one day they were calling my cousin the N-word, and I had to go over to get order 
on a field where they were calling my cousin the N word because mm. Wendell was throwing that heat, and they were that should be pitching. And the next, how old is he? Right, and the next N word <laughs> up is my brother. <laughs> and I, and again, just being, and then the, the humbling thing is to be able, I was raised in a family at a time to be able to handle that. Right. So uh, I also grew up thinking about African American and black guys. Uh, you could look up the names and do the research. In high school, I remember being afraid in the wrestling tournament of the black guy was wrestling. Because mm -hmm. I came from a place, I had some judgment. I came from a place of family. I thought I went to church, and I thought he may not have. He may not have the support. Maybe he didn't shower last night. My mama, you know, wiped my face this morning. I didn't know if he did. And Thanks I for talking him. about that, Haywood. And uh, I was afraid of him. That's and we he make beat internally. me in the first wrestling match in the first of the week. It was mostly fear. If if I hadn't known he was younger than me, I don't know if I'd even gotten in a match with him. Then okay. I figured, realized he was younger than me, and uh, we both played football. I was a little better at that. And so I was able to get in the ring, but there was something about uh, being in that ring that just being in there with a, a kid that wasn't from, wasn't the same kind of black guy I was that was like, I don't know what he'll do because mm -hmm. I didn't grow up. So I had those things uh, also. But um, learning that as we talk about segueing, to be aware and to activate my soul. Inside, I remember going to kindergarten as a little boy. Mm -hmm. And the day I lost the innocence was when I got <coughs> back home and she said, so did you make any friends? I said, yeah. Were the black or white? My mind scrambled like a, a, a computer. Because you don't think about it when you're a child. <laughs> I just made a friend. I didn't think what he was. Uh, uh, hair, skin. Oh, man. I'm, I'm, right. I'm, I'm probably not going to be good in school because I already missed out on the first test. I don't know what color people are. Thank you. So but that's I the had, honesty in. Right. I had no idea, and like you said, having been raised, but I knew who I was. Right. I was the kid that wanted to get along with everybody. And so to be aware of, I've learned now, and we talk about solutions, that there's a responsibility I feel like I have as an individual to represent my soul. Mm -hmm. Like I have a soul family. I have a skin family, and I have a hue family, but I have a soul family. And my soul family, one that's kind, that's compassionate, and that wants to see humanity survive. And that if I wake up every day and I commit, number one, to be aware and to activate mm -hmm. my soul, right. my soul, my soul burns brighter than my skin. And so to activate that, and maybe number two would then be to activate my mind. Like to initiate with how am I going to act in accordance to my soul? No. Use your mind to walk into who you are inside of you. And there's nobody, there's no television, there's no mm -hmm. Rush Limbaugh, uh, what's the other guy's <laughs> name? There's nobody, uh, my brother likes the other dude, uh, uh, but either way, there's no what. There's nobody. To, Jerry Springer. Uh, Jerry Springer. <laughs> and, uh, I, there's, there's another guy, too, the black guy, uh, radio. So, uh, But, uh, you know, there's nobody who can define you. And that I define myself. Hold your thought real quickly. I yes, want to give Steve an opportunity to interject on that topic a little bit. Do you have any opinions or comments, real quick? Oh, uh, no. I well, you know, it, I really liked when you talked about the story when you first you met your your first friend and your mom asked whether it was black or white. So you you taught me, hey, would uh, the idea of being childlike and how we um, approach relationships and yes. to let go of some of these biases that have built up as we grow up, as we become teenagers and young adults. Um, and to be childlike again and just listen to the other person's soul rather than listen to that other side of your brain that's telling you to be afraid. We're talking about trust, right? Yes. Because that's literally what we're talking yeah. about. So yeah. again, what, 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 what you guys are making me think about, and, and, and quite frankly, we're just gonna go jump right into this. You know, Mr. Haywood Simmons, it, it, it leads me into the tools to navigate uh, making these assumptions and the platform that you put together to help people navigate this and, and rise above this, uh, which is the Haywood Simmons organization. And uh, quite frankly, since you know we're here, why don't you talk to us about the share of mind, tell my audience what is the Haywood Simmons organization, first and foremost. We wanna know what the Haywood Simmons organization is, and then once you share with me what the Haywood Simmons organization is. Tell me specifically how the Haywood Simmons organization 
helps people like Steve and I, mm -hmm. who are uh, navigating assumptions and wanting to make intentional uh, uh, connections, how do you help foster that with your organization? Said, I thank you again, man. I appreciate this. The Haywood Simmons organization is a representation of all of us. Of mm -hmm. Forty-five years of meeting people, of knowing people, of play, of being a part of sports teams, of being a part of uh, academic clubs, honor society, and and meeting different people, and really getting a chance to touch and to feel their soul. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I found is that deep down inside, people are people and that we share hurts and we share joys and we have dreams. Mm -hmm. And we wear a lot of different faces. Mm -hmm. And having had a chance to be in locker room with guys from Fond du Lac and Dallas, Texas and uh, Wausau, Wisconsin and Rylander, Wisconsin and, mm -hmm. and New York and New Jersey, places I wasn't from, son and G and what word to God and stuff like that. I hadn't heard that was type of languages. To get a chance to meet those people mm -hmm. and to hear the, the histories of those people, the Haywood Simmons organization attempts to bring all that together in a way using technologies okay. or, or, or science proven ideas such as mindfulness. Talk to me about uh, how do you hire you? Haywood um, organization is using technology and mindfulness to help help us rise above navigating uh, these these assumptions that we were talking about. Number one, uh, Cedric, I spent some years in credit. Thank you, Eric Lewis and some others in technology learning how as a small business owner de mm -hmm. design and a social entrepreneur to design to navigate web and different technology platforms. So we utilize some super, some amazing platforms. One is an automated messaging system that we do every morning. You can get the morning, uh, your morning wood, uh, energy and encouragement every morning. Nice. We have an online mastermind so group. Intention. So with intention, every morning you can wake up with a motivational moment, with a meditation, with a tip that can lead Positivity. you into the day. So every day we use technology and uh, that way to help Love reach that. people. And, and we've seen it really help folks. The technology that we use in the mindfulness-based and evidence-based training, tapping, is something that we love teaching. But my favorite is meditation. Okay, Just well, learn to breathe. We yeah. would. When we, uh, before we go into the next segment, um, talk to us a little bit about how meditation, you know, helps us and helps us uh, get past some of these uh, assumptions. Thank you, and I, I appreciate that and uh, helping gather the thoughts too, bro. Um, some when we think we we often get caught between that logical side and that Thank creative you. side, mm -hmm. so we get we can get stuck in maybe worry or planning, really heavy planning, and doing a great job and building your career and raising kids and having eight babies and you hit them all. Good job. And then the creative side, that side we want to explore, that it helps us express ourselves, that being aware of those two sides, that that's something that always exists there. But what about the fear that sometimes exists in the middle of that? Because as we're navigating those things, the fear that, to me, from my perspective, that limits the connections and limits me from, from trusting someone that doesn't look like me, you know, comes from my quest to maintain, to obtain, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuits of happiness. So, you know, how, how can I overcome those things, you know, to learn to trust more, to learn to be open enough to make the connections with, with someone like, like Steve and to be a representative of people that look like me as we push forward. I want to know how for instance, if I'm in a work situation, and I'm gonna let, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about this mm -hmm. in, the, in the next segment, but mm -hmm. if I'm in a work situation and I go in as an African-American man, I'm the only person in the room, I'm the only African-American in the building, I'm working, how do I navigate and build friendships and connections when I also know that I'm navigating stereotypes and assumptions that are being, being made about me when I come through the door? Mm -hmm. And how do I know that? Because I can, I can uh, filter that through the comments that are being made from what, I do, what I'm doing, validating my experience, val basically validating why I'm sitting in the seat that I'm in and then having to prove that I can do the job. 
So again, hold that thought. I'm gonna let you. I'm gonna let you speak to it as soon as we come back on the next segment. Give me one minute. We'll be right back on the conversation shop. Welcome back to the conversation shop. Hey, we're gonna dive right back into this great conversation with Mr. Haywood Simmons and Mr. Steve Whalen. Uh, the conversation is about navigating assumptions and the tools to overcome making those assumptions and making intentional connections. On the last segment, I gave the example and, and, and asked Mr. Haywood to give us some examples of how the Haywood organization can provide tools and help someone like me that's in a corporate situation. I have a new job. I walk into the building. I'm the only person of color there. As the only person of color, I'm navigating and hearing some minor commentary about how did he get the job? You know, and then the questions come, who are you? And then you have to consistently repeat your resume, which is to validate you sitting in the seat. So how do you, how do you not make assumptions about the intentions of your coworkers towards you in order to foster an intentional connection, positive connection with someone at work? So navigating these racial things in a work environment as well. Those are some of the tools I think a lot of people would need. So I'm gonna to defer to you to answer that, but also I want you to finish sharing with my, matter of fact, prior to answering that, I want you to finish sharing with my audience who the Haywood Simmons organization, what the Haywood Simmons organization is and what you specifically do. Please do that. So we'll answer and to finish about the breath, to, with the breath, mm -hmm. to just breathe. I like to, to say, and we teach our clients, that it takes three breaths to get from your head, that busy head, to your heart. Mm -hmm. Scientifically, they say that both parts of our brain, we can get out of fight or flight mode and into a place where we can have access to both brains mm -hmm. and that just with three to seven breaths. So meditation helps us bring those that. two sides together. But when we're busy and our breaths are short, short breaths, short thought, shorter breath, shorter thought. So if we can have a deeper breath, we can have a deeper thought. Say that again, hey, Will, shorter you breath, just shorter thought. My head up with yeah, that. yeah, shorter breath, shorter thought. And the deeper we can breathe, um, the more access and capacity we have to be able to think. I love that. I love that. You hear yeah. it, hear us, audience. Yeah. Today. Shorter breaths, yeah. shorter thoughts. Yeah. Deeper breaths, deeper thoughts, deeper thinking. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Haywood, I just oh, had to man. share that. I love that. Thank you. Yeah. So, and what we do is, in a nutshell, is in the Haywood Simmons organization is help people free that inner child. That I remember speaking still, Stephen, I felt really brave and bravoed to, to share with uh, one of the school make a difference program. And they would say, tell the kids what it takes and what you believe it takes to be successful. And I remember when I was doing finance and they, we would tell people that, you know, first you get out of school, you had these big dreams and then you get a paycheck and you have to shrink them down into these your goals and dreams into your paycheck. Mm -hmm. And I always would say baloney. I chose a life where my dreams could stay alive. Right. And my inner child. And the other day we were with the Madison Police Department, we were talking about what our superpower is. And something came to me and said, one of my superpowers is my inner child is still alive. Now I gotta ask you this question, Haywood, real quickly. The inner child, I just want you to share with me, why is the inner child so important? Because from my perspective, the inner child is important because children come from a place of complete trust and honesty, there's no, it, they're not tainted. So there's no assumption. So they can take someone at face value. Mm -hmm. So again, my perspective, I don't want to speak for you, but I want you to elaborate on why that child perspective is so important. And what the Hayward and one of my mentors challenged me, said, Hayward, you tell them what you're doing is bringing the metaphysical, you may have heard okay. that, into the practice, but having us practice being more conscious. I like it, that. Say it, that again, sir. Having us practice being more conscious. And why is that important? I love that. Because as we become more conscious, it brings us into this present moment. It helps me see how I am reacting to life. Yes. I love that, Ava. And to be conscious is to be aware that I have choices. I cannot wear the title 
of African American. If that means disenfranchise, prove something, carry a yoke on your back, or limiting, I can be conscious and aware of how I wear that title. I am a hue bearing American, mm -hmm. Aboriginal American. Yes. That doesn't need any other titles than that to define myself. And I'll let you keep the rest of them. And can, let me hold you yes, there. I want to hold that thought. It doesn't mean that we're not navigating these systemic things that are out here. What he's saying, and I hope my audience hear this, we're not going to be limited by it. We're not going to limit ourselves by it. We're not gonna set roadblocks to our success, our happiness, and our intentional connections because of it. And we're not gonna allow that situation to cause assumptions to the best of our ability that would keep us from making connections with people that we would normally not do. So again, didn't mean to no. cut so off, I just wanted to add a that. Child and we do that and it, look, and it takes on a lot of different facets, but today you'll see us, we host a series of workshops on September the 18th. Okay. We're having a Say that again your, slowly. September the 18th, mm -hmm. we're having a Own Your Energy uh, workshop and clinic. It's going to be an announcement on our brand new website, which your viewers could go and What's preview. the website? It is the, it's HaywoodSimmonsJr.com. Okay, and where is this event being held? It's been held at 501 East Badger Road. That's 501 East Badger Road. Yep. And the event is called? It is the Own Your Energy The workshop. Own Your Energy Workshop. All you negative people trying to shake it off, Come on and get you some good ore, get some of that positive food, that positivity. And we're going to have healthy, organic food. I don't believe in giving you bad food. If you come visit my house, right, <laughs> we're going to have organic. So the Manuka honey alone is magic. I so just asked for a plate. The Manuka honey, hun honey, honey yeah. is real. Yeah. Haywood introduced me to that. Yeah. But let me with let you lime, finish, baby. I want you to finish telling them. Organic cayenne pepper. We're going to have organic light juice. We'll meditate and pray over the juice ahead of time. So we're going to have healthy foods. The mm -hmm. dishes will be organic dishes that you can use to reinvigorate your life just in the foods that we have. We're going to have a Q&A afterwards to learn and ask any questions you might have about how I beat depression, erectile dysfunction, high blood pressure, mm -hmm. and, and still alive today. What time does it start? It starts at six o'clock. It starts at six in the evening? Yes, sir. Six, six in the evening. I'm challenging uh, all the people in my audience here in the Madison and Fitchburg area to be a part of this, this organization. This is about, you know, uh, intention, intentional connections, navigating assumptions in a positive way, changing your spirit, changing your thought process through meditation, through understanding, through mindfulness, uh, through yoga, through fitness. I call Mr. Haywood Simmons, you know, the, the spiritual guru. I think he has homeopathic or a holistic health uh, that he does because he heals your mind, your body, and quite frankly, he heals parts of your soul. So there's a lot of positive things that comes with this. And to just go back to the example that I gave earlier in, in listening to Haywood, by when you're in a, a corporate situation, by taking away your negative thoughts, taking some deep breaths to allow yourself to center, to think clearly, to allow you to meet those things that we perceive or assume are negative to meet that in a positive way mm -hmm. because we know light always overcomes darkness. Mm -hmm. So if I'm consistent in my positiveness, then the only thing that can come from my interactions are something positive. So I just wanted to add that because as I, I'm also a participant of Mr. Haywood's mindfulness and also a participant of his organization and, and, and have uh, worked out with him and studied with him. And those are some of the things that I take from him. I think mindfulness is very important. Uh, Mr. Steve Whalen is a member of the organization as well. And uh, we have a couple minutes uh, left on the show. And Mr. Whalen, I want you to give us, tell me, give me a testimonial about your experience with the Haywood uh, Simmons organization and how it has helped you to navigating the things that we've talked about because through that navigation, it led to a great friendship and brotherhood between you and I. So I thank Mr. Haywood through his, his intention and through his mindfulness and through his meditation 
and positiveness, positive energy, mm -hmm. connecting me with another positive person because our friendship came from this space. That's so right. again, would you uh, give us uh, a testimonial or yeah. give my audience examples of how this organization has helped you and your family? You bet. So when, I, I guess I'll start by saying when I first met Haywood, um, we were at an event, um, Sustained Dane was, was uh, speaking on the, the racial equity mm -hmm. gap in Dane County and uh, there was a woman speaking named Sarah Alvarado and she spoke um, about you know, the issues going on but Haywood was at that event and at the end of the event she kind of gave a shout out to Haywood. They were talking, interacting with each other and I was really kind of struck by how um, kind and friendly he came across because when I first saw Haywood, I saw him as a fitness coach, a sporty guy, a guy who probably wouldn't want to have anything to do with me um, as a friend because I'm, a I'm not necessarily that kind of person. But I made the intention to go up and talk to Haywood and we had a conversation and I'm like, I need to get to know this guy better. So we intentionally made plans to get together and talk and, and get to know each other better. And my first thought was, oh, I have a couple, you know, young African-American teenagers that my, my sons are friends with. Maybe Haywood can help them out. I wasn't thinking about myself, um, maybe because I didn't think I needed any help, but I sure did. So um, getting to know Haywood, I learned first this idea, you know, just like on the airplane where you're supposed to, you know, the adult puts their oxygen mask on first and then helps the child. We need to help, we need to love ourselves. We need to have self-love. We need to have self-confidence. We need to be in a good place before we're gonna be able to be intentional and reach out and overcome these assumptions that we might have pe for people that look different than us. And Haywood taught me, you know, through my mindfulness, meditation, yoga, uh, physical, being uh, physical fit, you know, working out and making your body strong. And then thirdly is the nutrition. So those three things I've all gotten from, from Haywood Simmons and his partner, Michelle Naff, um, to learn that, that we have to be at our best if we're going to um, be change makers in this community. I love that. We have to be strong ourselves. So then we continued to work out together. It started out really just as a fitness coach and as a, the Sugar Free Me program that, that Michelle helped me out with. So eating better, being um, in better shape, my body, taking care, better care of my body. Um, and then we got into some of the mindfulness stuff. Um, Haywood taught me the idea of TAG, which I think is so <coughs> awesome. What they, is TAG, real quick? TAG is being thankful, appreciative, and grateful uh, for the things in your life. And I'm gonna hold you right there. Yep. Yeah. Um, before we go and end the show. Yes, sir. Leave my audience with TAG. I will do that. Right, yes. Real quick, go yes. ahead. Yeah. I am thankful that um, I had the opportunity to meet Hay Haywood because it also gave me the opportunity to meet my friend said and to get to know them better. I appreciate how Haywood has taught me to take care of myself, both my, my mind, my body, and my, the way that I eat um, and the nutrition that I have. And I am grateful that Haywood gave me two really important lessons to navigate assumptions. One is the idea of, of being having empathy for the person you're talking to. And for me, the best way to do that, this, this is something Haywood taught me, was the idea of being curious, not judgmental. Thank so, you. We're going to leave my audience with that. And guys, I want to thank you for joining us on the Conversation Shop. And we'll see you next time.